I once attended a Q&A with Art Spiegelman. He was asked by an attendee how he felt about being called the father of the graphic novel. He took a long drag from a cigarette in a non-smoking auditorium and replied, If I'm the father, I want a paternity test. He continued that comics are comics, plain and simple. And a graphic novel is just a term used by people who wish to wash their hands of all those other comics that don't fall into their opinion of high art. I grew up aimlessly perusing the aisles of my father's comic book store, and later after that closed, I wandered the cold fluorescent brick walled community gymnasiums of local comic cons, and then I watched those turn into crowd packed expos over the span of two decades. I read comics before I read books, and when I read Alan Moore's Lutchman, it changed me. It changed how I thought about the world. And before you go any further, if you haven't read it, stop whatever the fuck it is you're doing and pick it up. If you're anything like me, you won't be able to put it down. And after you have, you'll pick it up and read it again and again. It's a magnetic neo-noir set in an alternate Cold War reality about a disbanded group of superheroes or anti-heroes, depending on how you look at it, brought together by the death of a fellow member of their crime-fighting team, the Watchmen. It follows each individual gracefully jumping back and forth between the past and present. Somebody has to save the world. Explaining the characters and the actions that made them who they are. All the while, the tensions between the US and the USSR reach a fever pitch of nuclear confrontation. Rorschach is as close to a main character as one can get in this comic. A violent paranoid that believes someone is killing off masked superheroes. What is it? This little stain, is that bean juice or... That's right, human bean juice. <laughs> Badge belonged to the comedian, blood too. I shall go and tell the indestructible man that someone plans to murder him. Good evening, Rorschach. Good evening, Dr. Manhattan. He sets out to warn his old comrades, and slowly but surely is joined by each of them. In the process of trying to unravel the knotted and complicated murder plot, they discover evidence that leads them to believe their old companion, Ozymandias, might be to blame. They confront him, but by the time they do, it's too late. Do you seriously think I'd explain my mass destruct to you if there were even the slightest possibility you'd affect the outcome? He set into motion a plan to end the Cold War that cost the lives of millions. End the war. I did it. I did it! The group is forced to make a decision, tell the truth about Odyssey's massacre, or lie, and preserve the newly found peace. Peace based on a lie, but peace, nonetheless, is right. Exposing Hadrian would only do the world to nuclear destruction again. No. We can't do this. On Mars. You taught me the value of life. If we hope to preserve it here, we must remain silent. Rorschach decides to tell the truth. Sadly, he's the only one. Out of my way. People have to be told. You know I can't let you do that. What are you waiting for? Do it! I tossed out a word earlier. Noir, a word that many associate with the aesthetic of any given story, but noir is more than just rain beating on a fedora under a street lamp more than archetypes of femme fatales and hard-jawed criminals. Where is he? What? Great Noirs ask a question of the audience. What would you do? Take the Maltese Falcon. P.I. Spade chooses to send the woman he loves off to prison or her possible execution for a morally ambiguous murder. I hope they don't hang you, precious, for that sweet neck. Or Double Indemnity, where Keyes, played by Robinson, chooses to report his best friend and trusted colleague to the police for his part in a murder and insurance fraud plot. 
There's a guy you were looking for was too close. Right across the desk from you. Closer than that, Walter. I love you too. These characters, like Rorschach, make a uniquely noir decision. They don't choose what's best for them or even what's best for society as a whole. These characters have an unwavering moral compass. One that is guided by truth. In this way, many of the heroes of noir, especially Rorschach, are deontological. A fancy way of saying that they look at the actions of a person and make a value judgment. The consequences of said action are unimportant. What matters is whether the action itself was right or wrong. And we come to know what is right and wrong thanks to moral norms that we set for ourselves. Men get arrested. Blocks get put down. The deontologist values the rules so over all health. Does one death matter against so many? Because there is good and there is evil, and evil must be punished. Even in the face of Armageddon, I shall not compromise in this. Immanuel Kant thought that these morals were a given, that right and wrong could easily be flushed out through reason and reason alone. I don't think that Rorschach cared for Kant's opinion that much, though, as he certainly violates several of Immanuel Kant's categorical imperatives, chiefly using people as a means to an end. But make no mistake, he is deontological, because what matters to him the most is whether you follow the rules. The problem, of course, with Rorschach is that the rules are set by him. It's agent-centered, and while we can empathize with his value system, we have to keep in mind that the moral constants that he holds the world to were informed by him through the traumas he's experienced as both a boy and a man. His mother neglected him, his peers abused him, the world turned its back on him. He's seen the worst of the world and given up on any ideas of rehabilitation. Rotting society, what it calls rehabilitation. Nothing short of compromise. He reads as a perfect example of a paranoid, yet he's self aware enough to know that few of the costumed heroes left are without disorders. Why are so few of us left active, healthy, and without personality disorders? For all his flaws, I can't help but admire him and characters like him, deontological heroes that place their duty to the rule of law, no matter how subjective or dodgy that rule may be over all else. Uh, uh, you... You just couldn't let me go, could you? Characters that don't relent their grip on the truth, even when facing down certain death. Do it! On the other side of the coin, we have Ozymandias, a villain of sorts, but that of course depends on how you look at the picture. Because in this universe, nuclear holocaust seems almost certain. It's time, gentlemen. Take us to Death Con, Warden. Ozymandias personifies consequentialism, which holds that consequences of an action and not the action itself is the ultimate basis for any judgment of right and wrong, good or evil. It's a superpowers retreating from war. I'll save the earth from hell. Specifically, Ozymandias is part of the utilitarian subset of consequentialists. Utilitarianism deals with maximizing utility or worth while remaining neutral or impartial to the subject's own interests. Killing millions to save billions. Necessary crime. Intentions are unimportant to utilitarianism, but I want to get into them to better flesh out this idea. His decision, like Rorschach, likely stems from his own personality disorder. He has a need for admiration. Alexander of Macedonia. I idolized him. I was determined to measure my success against his. A lack of empathy. Blake's murder. You confess? Confession implies penitence. I merely regret his accidental involvement. 
and an exaggerated sense of self-worth. My intellect set me apart. Faced with difficult choices, I knew nobody whose advice might prove useful. Nobody living. And rightfully so, he's the only man in this world that's smart enough to trick, well, God. Light, don't. I'm not a comic book villain. The film unfortunately reduces Ozymandias and his decision because it leaves out the tale of the Black Freighter that goes on in the background of the comic. In the tale, the marooned mariner survives a pirate attack by the Black Freighter. He crafts a raft from the dead bodies of his fallen comrades in order to return to shore and hopefully warn his home of the impending danger of the pirates. Alan Moore explained that it was initially a creative choice to show the characters of this world would read tales of pirates because they already had real superheroes. But as the story manifested itself, he found it more and more to be reflective of Ozymandias' arc. According to Richard Reynold, the Mariner is forced by the urgency of his mission to shed one inhibition after another. Just like Adrian, he hopes to stave off disaster by using the dead bodies of his former comrades as a means of reaching his goal. The comedian and millions of others. His intentions were good, but again, intentions are unimportant through a utilitarian lens, only the consequences. On the macro, the consequences are good. He maximizes utility. His decision reunites the world, though on the micro, I it leaves him right remarkably thing, I, alone. It all worked out in the end. In the end? Nothing ends, Adrian. Nothing ever ends. John, wait. What do you mean by... The Mariner, yet is forced to face his genocide. How had I reached this appalling position with love, only love as my guide? So there it is, one man guided by truth. Never compromise, not even in the face of Armageddon. And another guided by love. I've made myself feel every day. See every innocent face I've murdered to save humanity. You understand, don't you? Without condoning. Or condemning. I understand.